just like to open with a little prayer. This little prayer I read most mornings when I remember. But it's a great little prayer. Let's pray. Lord of my life, I kneel in your presence this morning hour that my first response may be to you. For many voices distract me as the day goes on. O Lord, you have lent me my body for life. Let me keep at a distance this day all that would mar its fitness and freshness and strength. You have lent me my mind for thought and for the treasuring of things true and honest, just and pure, all that is lovely and of good report. You have lighted within my spirit a flame that will never go out, but it often flickers, and there are times, I confess, when it goes unattended. Please forgive me. I rejoice, rejoice that your hand is upon the whole of my life. Let me live this day to the full, that I may be an interpreter of Jesus Christ to those with whom I have to do. Strengthen my will to serve, deepen my love, and set some laughter upon my lips. In Jesus' name, Amen. I told my 14-year-old granddaughter that I was asked to speak in church and asked her to suggest a subject she would like me to speak on. She said, prove to me that there is a God. I asked her what a second choice was, but she insisted. And I began to think of things that have happened in my life that will prove to me, let alone my granddaughter, that there is a God. And unfortunately, a more uneventful life you couldn't imagine. So how could someone from the 20th century convince someone from the 21st century that God exists? You know, there's so many things we need proof of for in today's world, isn't there? And if it can't be proven, then it is not true or it doesn't exist. How old are you? Are you male or female? Who was your father? Who was your mother? Where were you born? Where were your parents born? I think if you lose your birth certificate these days, you've had it. Because nobody believes you. And unless you have evidence in black and white. Now, some would think it an easier task to disprove God exists if you take into account the seemingly unanswered prayers, financial problems, disagreements, illnesses, conflicts, crimes, hardships and trials we face during our time here on earth. And Mahatma Gandhi was once approached by an atheist with the request to organise and promote an anti-God society. Gandhi replied, it amazes me to find an intelligent person who fights against something that he does not believe exists. But in my quest to find an answer, my thoughts turn to a man who has helped convince me that God exists. This man is John Newton, the man made famous by his wonderful song, Amazing Grace. And as so as by coincidence, I was loaned a book titled John Newton from Disgrace to Amazing Grace. And as I began to read, the picture of a really bad person came to light from his early years at sea, culminating in his appointment as captain of his first ship, a ship purposely built for slave trading. But during one of his voyages, his ship, the Greyhound, was severely damaged, and half the bow was torn off in heavy weather, and then they encountered an Atlantic gale which lasted for 14 days. And because of the seamanship and the courage of Newton at the helm of the Greyhound, Land Ho was again heard and the ship drunk, dropped anchor in calm waters. Newton said, about this time I began to know that there is a God who hears and answers prayers. This was the moment of John Newton's conversion. Here's a little part of the book. It says, without William Wilberforce, there would have been no successful parliamentary campaign in the 18th and early 19th century for the abolition of the slave trade. 
but without John Newton, William Wilberforce would not have been engaged in such a role, for it was Newton who in 1783 persuaded the young MP for Hull not to give up his career in politics in order to enter the church. It was Newton whose experience as a former slave ship captain provided Wilberforce with the authentic information he used to such devastating effect in attacking the slave trade. Above all, it was the bonding with Newton that gave Wilberforce that powerful combination of political motivation driven by Christian conviction that inspired his abolitionist campaign and enabled him to persevere through many years of defeats and disappointments. So you can see how the story of one man has helped my belief in the existence of God. But does it do anything for a 14 year old? You can probably count on one hand the things I could put down as God moments in my life. Firstly, I guess, there was a feeding of the meeting of my wife. I lived in Cessnock, she lived in Newcastle, and I was invited to a dance at the YMCA in Mayfield at the last moment. I'd never been there before. During the barn dance, when everyone else dances with everyone else, I found in my arms a young girl who had never been there before. And for some reason, I decided not to pass her on to the next, next partner, who was left wandering around the dance floor on his own. And secondly, one night, as a toddler, my eldest son Jason was very sick and I could not sleep. About 1am, I got up to see if he was all right. As I came to the doorway of his room, I felt the most definite presence of somebody else. As I entered his room, the presence vanished. But Jason was sound asleep and he was okay. But I can't remember whether I slept the rest of that night. But do my simple experiences prove to another the existence of God? And when I think about it, my experiences and how things have worked out in my life, apart from that incident with Jason, could be put down to coincidence. Unless that is, I couple them to my belief in God. Now I have certificates that say I'm a member of Tea Gardens, Maitland Baptist Church. In fact, I think I even have a certificate that says I'm a member of the Warners Bay Methodist Church. But they don't state that I believe God exists. Maybe it was just taken that I did. One advantage of having these certificates is it allows me to park in the members only spot in the Uniting Church car park at Maitland. I remember 40 years ago, might be a bit over 40 years ago, there was a movie that started with the scene looking into deep outer space and the words, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Do you remember it? Star Wars came into our lives. Now my grandson Tom was born into this wonderful age of technology. What Tom doesn't know about Star Wars isn't worth knowing. I remember when our children were born, it was a contest between Chris and I to get the babies to say either mum, mum, mum or dad, dad, dad. Tom's, were, Tom's first words, I'm sure, were, were press play. But when you compare the opening words of the Star Wars adventure to the opening words of the Bible, Star Wars, to me, fades into insignificance. Genesis 1 says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Those words, inspired by the one who created them, opens to us an insight as to whether God does or does not exist. But what do we get from reading this book? There was a philosopher at an otherwise dull convention, at convention explaining how he had become a Christian. He said, I picked up the New Testament with the view of judging it, to weighing up the pros and cons. But as I read it, I realised that I was the one being judged. Now I must admit that when I began this talk, I discovered that my fitting and machining textbooks did not contain many arguments for the existence of God, or for that matter the non-existence of God. And so I put the question to good friends who are much more learned than I, 
and I'm ever so grateful that God led them to me or me to them. Firstly, I asked my good friend, he came back with a suggestion of adding some historical or some scientific arguments. And I looked up a bloke called Josephus and I discovered this. In Rome, in the year 93 AD, Josephus published his lengthy history of the Jews and included the following account. About this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. For he was one who performed surprising deeds and was a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many Greeks. He was the Messiah. And when upon the accusation of the principal men among us, Pilate had condemned him to a cross. Those who had first come to love him did not cease. He appeared to them, spending a third day restored to life, for the prophets of God had foretold these things and a thousand other marvels about him and the tribe of Christians, so called after him, has still to this day not disappeared. And then secondly, I asked another friend and he told me of a lot of experiences he had had and how he cannot see how all these experiences could have happened without the input of God. But as I listened to his stories, although I believed him, they were not real to me. And thirdly, I told my Bible study group of my dilemma and I was given a publication of 20 arguments for the existence of God. Now to read these arguments was a challenge and while I could understand their arguments it was heavy going and to translate their thoughts into this sermon was beyond me. But one of the arguments was titled The Argument from Miracles and I found this interesting and a little bit amusing. It seems in Texas numerous stones rain down from the sky. Would you call this a miracle or a, a, an act of nature. I guess they would be classes of strange happening. However, if a holy man had stood in the middle of the main street of Houston and said, God wants you to repent, and as a sign of his displeasure, he's going to shower you with rocks, then moments later, clunk, 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 down came the stones, the word miracle might well spring to mind. But are events recorded by a Jewish historian 2,000 years ago or personal experiences of a good friend or arguments of learned scholars going to convince a 14 year old that God exists? Would they convince a 69 year old God exists? Well they might but I'm afraid I'm not one of them. But finally I asked my good friend Barry and Barry had this to say he says, your granddaughter has set her grandfather an impossible task, for it is impossible to either prove or disprove the existence of God. Well, thanks Barry, that's about as helpful as a hip pocket and a singlet. But he wasn't finished. He continued. He said, if we were able to prove that God exists, it will totally destroy Christian faith. Note the word faith. Christian Christianity is built on faith. Romans chapter 1 verse 17 says, The just shall live by faith. And Hebrews chapter 11, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. In Romans chapter 10 verse 5, for Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend unto heaven, that is, to bring Christ down 
or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? It says the word is near you, in your mouth, in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls in the, on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call him, call on him, in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. And so you see, if we could prove the existence of Christ, or the existence of God, there'd be no, necess no necessity or requirement to exercise faith. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that one may boast. Grace through faith is a gift of God. There was a king who wished to express his regard for a private soldier in his army and gave him a richly jewelled cup, his own cup. The soldier stepping forth to receive the gift exclaimed shamefacedly, this is too great a gift for me to receive. The king replied, it is not too great a gift for me to give. You know, God gave us a gift that we might have eternal life. God, his son Jesus Christ, was not too great a gift for us. Do you believe that? Jesus Christ offers us the infinite gift of the Holy Spirit to cleanse and fill our hearts and to abide with us. Do you believe that? Then how much do you, or then how much he must have cared that we received it? What a waste it would have been not to accept the gifts God has given us. How hurtful to God for us to refuse his gift. The following is a quotation from the words of Dr. W. B. Hinson speaking from the pulpit a year after the commencement of an illness, an illness from which he ultimately died. He said, I remember a year ago when a man in this city said, you have to go to your death. I walked out to where I live, five miles out of the city, and I looked across at that mountain that I love, and I looked at the river in which I rejoice, and I looked at the stately trees that are always God's own poetry to my soul. Then in the evening I looked up into the great sky where God was lighting his lamps, and I said, I may not see you many more times, but mountain, I shall be alive when you are gone, and river, I shall be alive when you cease running to the sea, and stars, I shall be alive when you have fallen from your sockets in the great downpulling of the material universe. This is the confidence of one who knew the Saviour, and it is yours. But as I near the end of this search to prove God exists, I have one final hurdle to clear, and that is, how I can differentiate between what is my belief and what is my faith. And there's many examples of this in the archives and they simply define the difference. But what about personal, practical examples? And I thought long and hard about this to me and what it means to me. And hopefully it will show you the difference. You see, 
When Christine was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, I believed that God, because of my faith and my prayers, would heal her. Everything rested on my faith. Everything I had learned since Sunday school said to me, God will not let me down. My faith, even as small as it was, convinced me that God would answer my prayers. But it wasn't to be. But you see, my belief in God hasn't diminished. But right or wrong, I guess my faith in him has. After all, I'm only human. But before you suggest I visit a counsellor, listen to this. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands, in his hands the marks of the nails and place my fingers into the mark of and place my fingers into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I'll never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be to you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put it to your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve but believe. And Thomas answered him and said, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You know, Thomas was one of those people who had been with Jesus for at least three years. He'd witnessed all he'd done and heard what Jesus had said and yet he didn't believe. I well, really think he was the one who needed counselling. But strangely enough, since Christine died, Christine died, I just want to read and read and read. I don't seem to be able to get enough of God's word. And I'm finding the words of God. They encourage my spirit because he's told me, you know, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. You know, God is showing me things that I've, I've never known or felt before and I feel safe now no matter what happens. And my faith, probably not all that strong at the moment, is growing. And my understanding of what faith is, is also growing. But I'd like to read you this little poem. It was God who put these words in my heart. And I know it was God, because I'm not that clever called just a handful of dirt. A handful of dirt on a hill far away, just a handful of rocks and stones. Can I tell the story from long ago and why it has sombre tones? If you study it close you will see in the rocks a stain of something dark and feel the presence of somebody near yet somebody torn apart. You close your hand and feel it grind as the particles crunch and move and the sharp pieces bite and cut the skin of the palm of your hand so smooth. You begin to wonder if times now past in a time of injustice and fear and you feel the hurt in that handful of dirt and you find it will bring a tear. For above this dirt there rose a cross and a man was hung there to die and his blood run down and darkened the ground and the whole world wondered why. And the earth had quaked on that terrible day and darkness was all around as the blood of a man so just and true soaked into holy ground. Then you look at the dirt you hold in your hand as the colour it stains your skin and you think, do I have his blood on my hands? And your feelings churn within. You throw it down from where it came and you try to clean the stain but no matter how much you rub and scratch, the colour still remains. And you look at the ground, it's a handful of dirt. And you lift your eyes to the sky and you remember the man and the reason he came and the reason he had to die. For the Son of Man and the Son of God gave his life so willingly and you know that his grace, both given and shown, was intended for you and for me. You know, this sermon has been an emotional roller coaster ride for me. It's made me look at things I'd never have thought of, many of which I haven't been able to include in this talk. 
Now, when Mary Magdalene left the tomb, there was no evidence that any of the believers ever returned to it. And furthermore, there was no gospel evidence that any of the enemies of Jesus ever visited the tomb. His enemies did not go because they were afraid it might be empty. Jesus' friends did not return to the tomb because they knew it was empty. You know, the God I believe in is alive. He'll continue to be by my side, not in front, not behind, but by my side. Talking to me, pointing out the obstacles, holding my hand, laughing, crying with me, and always encouraging me. It's a wonderful thing to know. And I wish I could transplant this knowing into the heart of my granddaughter. But this is a journey and a discovery she will have to take on her own, as we all have had to do. But I can be beside her. Now my God does exist. My growing faith and my belief remove any doubts. And because of his grace, his amazing grace, my future with him and the one I love is assured. But one other important thing I've learned is never to ask Sophie what she'd like me to talk about again. But then again, what's life without a challenge? Amen. Um, yeah.